نحمده و نسلم و نسلم على رسوله الكريم و على آله و أصحابه و من تبعهم بإحسان لنا يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله we have done a great portion of wudu we have dealt with the sunnats of wudu we have dealt with the fara'id of wudu we have dealt with some of the mustahabbats of wudu the desirable acts we continued with those things that causes wudu to become broken and uh, we are almost finished with those inshallah those invalidators of wudu we just have two more which we will continue with tonight inshallah and uh, that is becoming unconscious insane or drunk will invalidate the wudu if a person last week we spoke about sleeping and uh, we slo- we spoke about sleeping in the posture of salah the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that that did not break salah it did not break wudu and of course if it doesn't break the wudu it would not break the salah and uh, in this case so unconsciousness is something that is above sleep likewise becoming insane likewise becoming insane and in the book al-hidayah they have mentioned the difference between the two one is whereby a person becomes unconscious something becomes over overpowering over himself and he does not know himself the dominance over the mind and becoming insane is whereby one actually loses their mind so to a greater extent a person who is insane they will lose their, lose their wudu because they don't know what is going on with them at all being insane the person will do things that they are not even aware of right so they would not even be aware sometimes they can mess up themselves etc they will not be be aware if they pass when etc so being insane sometimes it can happen off and on as how some people so to say as it is said they trip right they lose their mind for some time and then they get back well if it happens for a span of time their wudu will become broken Allah knows best if they take an injection they take their medication and then all of a sudden alhamdulillah everything is okay right if it happened that they were in the state of wudu before and everyone saw them making wudu but they became insane to a certain extent they lost their mind no one would have known if they would have passed wind including the individual themselves so therefore wudu will become broken or j- becoming in a state of or being drunk will invalidate the wudu if a person becomes drunk ma'ad Allah they, it doesn't mean that we are allowed to drink alcohol or it doesn't mean that we are allowed to become drunk hey the fuqaha they will deduce all those things they will try to bring hypothetical situations whereby we would know what would happen in that case for example ma'ad Allah if a person was spiked if someone spiked a person's drink and they placed some alcohol there when a person did not know and ma'ad Allah the person became drunk now come from the masjid ma'ad Allah went to have a drink at someone's home and the person just starts to laugh loudly right do different things out of his normal habit and then the person becomes intoxicated time for isha salah they went for maghrib time for isha salah the person is a bit drip, um, tipsy right falling all over himself it will cause the wudu to become invalidated if the person is drunk because they will not be aware then we continue with regards to the invalidators of wudu the allowed laughter of a balik person while awake in salah will invalidate the wudu the allowed laughter of a valid of a balik person while awake in salah will invalidate the wudu this is called according of course to the ruling of the hanafi jurists imam shafi rahmatullahi is of the opinion nothing comes out that is impure when we laugh so therefore that should not break wudu that should not break wudu and the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that which comes out from the sabi lane causes the wudu to become broken however 
Ahnaf uses the dalil of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherein this sahabi, we may have mentioned that already, who he tripped, there was something wrong with his eye and he tripped when he entered into the masjid and some, the sahabas who were performing salah laughed. Some of them would have laughed loudly. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them who laughed loudly to repeat their salah and their wudu would have been broken. And specifically also the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, well that was part of the hadith. Man kah kaha minkum. Whosoever has laughed loudly from amongst yourselves, let him fal yu'id al wudu. Let him repeat the wudu. So loud laughter of a balik person, a balik person here means a person who has reached the age of puberty. The person who has discernment, the person who has understanding. So the laughter of a child will not cause their wudu to become broken. The laughter of a child, they are not mukallaf of deen. So therefore their wudu will not become broken. This is why the children who are studying to become hufad, etc. And they are in madrasa or they are in a masjid. And they are studying to become a hufad, a hafiz of Quran, memorization of the Holy Quran. Or they are in maktab. They come on a daily basis. They come on Saturday, Sunday, whatever have you. They might be going to the washroom, they might pass when in the classroom, but it is permissible for them not to be in a state of wudu because they are children. They are not mukallaf. They are young children. If we make it difficult upon them, then it will seem like deen is too difficult for them. Children are playing, they are, on, they are not knowing of their things. Right? It's a different thing altogether that we are training them now so when they get a little bigger and they have not reached the age of puberty, just as the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, encourage them to perform salah at the age of seven, then out of training, we will let them go and make wudu when they pass wind uh, or when they laugh loudly in salah, right? At the age of 10, he said, strike them lightly whilst they, to, um, to perform salah. So at, at these ages, when they get a bit older, we would not make them make wudu on account of it is compulsory upon them to make wudu because sana is not compulsory upon them. But they need the training. They need the training. So therefore, this is why we will tell them to make wudu. Right? So a loud laughter of a balik person while awake in salah will invalidate the wudu. Will invalidate the wudu while the person is awake and uh, they are performing salah. Um, there are different types of laughter that would call the that it will be mentioned again inshallah in kitab al salah the one that would cause wudu to become broken is loud laughter loud laughter and how do the fuqaha define loud laughter that the person our neighbor who is next to us they can hear it they can hear the laughter when we giggle right sometimes we say we just had a little giggle and the person next door, they can actually hear that. That would cause the wudu and the salah to become broken. Because as we said, if our wudu is broken, our salah is broken. And uh, the next type of laughter is dhikh. Whereby we can call that like a smile. Um, a smile with showing the teeth. Right? Sorry. Dhikh is like laughed, laughing to ourselves. Yes. Dhikh is like laughing to ourselves whereby we hear ourselves laugh but our neighbor next door he doesn't hear it like we as we say we speak to ourselves and it is only i heard what i said so we laugh a little bit and i am the one who heard my laughter that would not cause wudu to become broken it would cause salah to become broken and the third type of laughter is that of tabassum smiling whether we show the teeth or not Whilst we are smiling, it doesn't cause the salah to become broken, nor does it cause, to a greater extent, wudu does not become broken. Right? So smiling, smiling in salah will not break salah. As we said, these things, we are not speaking about whether we should smile or not in salah. Right? Salah, we are supposed to be concentrating and so on. But sometimes it happens that a person may smile because of something. If that, that is the case, then... They know that salah is not broken, wudu is not broken. Laughing, laughing to the extent whereby a person hears himself alone, the person next door does not hear him. 
Then he breaks his salah. He doesn't break his wudu. What he would have to do? Stand back the salah. The third person is that one who laughs loudly. He himself hears it. The people he ate next door to him. His salah and wudu will become broken. So these things will cause wudu to become broken inshallah. Laughing in that manner. So we have completed inshallah the invalidators of wudu. As we have mentioned, we did the invalidators of wudu. We did the entire method of wudu. We did occasions when wudu is desirable. We spoke about certain things that are not recommended while we are making wudu, right? And uh, initially we spoke a bit about water. So we will continue with purification with water. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He mentions that what? He has sent down water to purify us. And subhanallah, water really has that quality of purifying. If we have no soap, then yet still, mashallah, water will cause our hands to become clean. It will cause our body to become clean. Ritually and physically, inshallah. So, we continue with ghusl. Bath. In the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi rahman ar-rahim. Wa in kuntum junuban fattahharu. And if you are in a state of janaba, then make fattahharu. Purify yourself. Fattahharu. Amrum bil ittihar. It's a command to purify, and it is not just the normal purification. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the siha that he has used in the Holy Quran, fattahharu. It's an exaggerated form of purification. So, the scholars have deduced from that, it means that we will purify ourselves in the best way possible in all, by washing all the external parts. By washing all the external parts. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will mention some of the traditions inshallah, People would have come to him, would have asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, does this cause wudu to become compulsory? Does this cause ghusl to become compulsory? Do I have to make wudu? What is the case? The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have explained for them, inshallah. So, ghusl, ghusl, is the name for the act of washing the entire external body. Ghusl is the name for the act of washing the entire external body. When we speak about the external body, we mean everything that can be touched. Everything that is considered to be outside. And we spoke about that. We have our, the external parts of our fingers. Then we will have under our nails. We have our ears. It has a hole. How far do we go with regards to ghusl? The external parts of our body. The entire external part. And uh, in washing the external part... We mean those parts of the body and the scholars mean those parts of the body that is easy to wash. And it is practical that we can put water there. For example, we are speaking about the air. There will be quite down by the air drum that if we were to put oil or if we, go to, if we were to swim, water can reach down there and then it would not be able to come up very easily. We would have to jump on one side in order for that to, water to come out or if you put some oil it could possibly come out in that with in that manner also right but that is external to a certain extent but that is not what we are talking about because why that is a difficult type of external if a person were to have to if it was compulsory upon an individual to let water touch there they may probably have to use a long q-tip to try to get water inside of there and they would damage themselves also because the air drum is something that is, you know, it is very soft and it is very fragile to a certain extent with regards to becoming damaged. So, external means those parts of the external body which is easy that we can reach. Our eyes, 
Our eyes, when we open our eyes, we see with our eyes. But the eyeball is something of a different nature, although it may be external. So therefore, we do not have to ensure because it will become difficult. And Islam is something that is very easy, mashaAllah. And it is very practical, day-to-day -day living. As we have said, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam lived it. The Sahabas lived it. And men and women would come and ask the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam questions. So, with regards to the eyes, we do not have to ensure that water were to reach by the pupil and the white portion of the eye. Because that is difficult. So therefore, what is easy, mashaAllah, if we were to close our eyes, then all are over the eyelid, it is essential for water to reach. So, ghusl is the name of the act of washing the entire external body. All the parts of our body and under the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned tahta kulli sha'ratin janaba as we will come up to that also inshallah. Beneath every grain of hair, there is janaba. Beneath every grain of hair is janaba. So therefore, when Hadha Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said because of that, Adaitu ra'si, he waged war against his head. So he used to shave off his hair so that there was no possibility of any part, portion of the hair not being wet. So he used to cut off his hair. So every part of our body that, is, that has hair, and we'll come up to mention it in different places inshallah, we have to ensure that it becomes washed. The eyes, difficult, no problem, not inside the eyeball. The ears, in, way inside the ears, right? Just outside, mashallah, which is easy, that we can see right on the external portion of our ears. Even in wudu, we wet that. Then we have to wet that also for ghusl. Continuing, inshallah, the intention of performing such an act, which is not permissible without ghusl, is the cause for ghusl to become compulsory? Example, salah. Just as we explained with wudu, we will explain when, what are the factors that cause ghusl to become compulsory? What are the factors that cause it to become compulsory? But when does ghusl actually become compulsory? We spoke about a person can be in a state of janaba, and the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke about, and he himself, when he was in a state of janaba, he wanted to eat or drink. He mentioned that he would make wudu, so therefore we can make wudu, sleep and eat, and a person will be in a state of janaba. But when is it compulsory? It means that a person, let's say for example. One of the factors that causes a person to become in a state of janaba and they will have to take ghusl is having a wet dream. So when a person has a wet dream, the question is, is it that immediately as I wake up and I open my eye, I must head straight to that bathroom to perform ghusl? A person has relations, man or woman. We will come up to that inshallah. That causes ghusl to become compulsory. Is it that immediately after a person has relations, they need to perform ghusl, they must perform ghusl. This is what we are dealing with here. When does ghusl become compulsory? Ghusl be, will become compulsory with, and it is mentioned here, intending to perform an act because you will intend to do that act. So therefore, you will have to fulfill the prerequisites of that act, which is not permissible without ghusl. For example, salah or recitation of the Holy Quran or entering the masjid, we will come up to those things inshallah, right? So, whilst a person has had a wet dream, they cannot read Quran, they cannot read Quran, they cannot perform salah, they cannot enter into the masjid. So now they want to enter into the masjid. It will be compulsory for them to make ghusl in order for to come into the masjid. They want to come into the masjid to sleep. This is why even in Atikaf, when a person is spending sunnah to the Atikaf, they cannot leave the masjid for a sunnah ghusl. But now, 
they have they had a wet dream they have to go out immediately and then come back and perform ghusl and then come back because they want to stay in the masjid right we will come up to a few ahadith like that inshallah person wants to read quran read quran read their evening portion of quran but they had relations with their wife so they have already performed the isha salah but they want to fulfill their normal daily duty and daily routine they cannot just read quran like that they have to perform ghusl so the intention of performing an act which is not permissible without ghusl is the cause for ghusl to become compulsory so therefore they will perform the ghusl when they have performed the ghusl they can enter into the masjid they can read quran they can now perform salah understand the difference inshallah so if they were if they didn't want to read if they if they had relations and they wanted to sleep they can go and sleep it is not that it's haram to sleep in the state of janaba it's not that we're not talking about what is best we need to know fiqh this is what the fiqh does and this is the importance of understanding the ahadith of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam sometimes he would mention general statements sometimes the sahabas people the people would ask them questions is it so do is it do must i perform this sometimes they answered the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it the companions did it so we also do it and then they would ask again and and they, and they would give that answer but that answer does not actually tell you if it is compulsory or not when the fuqaha and even the the, the sahabas would have done that this is why Hadha Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would have waged war against those people who did not get, want to give the rope in sadaqah after the demise of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why would he be so strong about waging war against them? Because zakah is compulsory. You cannot just be lenient with zakat and he was the caliph. He was the amir of that time. He was responsible. So therefore, you do not pay it, you will be held accountable. In the sight of Allah, yes, you will be held accountable. But in this worldly life, being the caliph and being in an Islamic state, he would put out punishment and he would wage war against those, he said. So it shows the strength of it. So it is compulsory. So this is what we are saying, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Fiqh and the rules that we are doing, the, what, the, what the ulama have done is made it simple for us, mashallah, that we will be able to answer these questions. We would be able to know a situation because we will not be in the jungle every day. We will not be traveling from here to another place every day. But when it comes up, what do we do? We are in the plane. We are in the plane. We are sleeping. We get a wet dream. It was an uncomfortable sleep. You are sleeping and your head is rocking from side to side. A wet dream comes. Is it that, oh, it is haram for me to sit in this state? What do I do? Do I close the, uh, the, 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 the washroom and try to fill water, keep filling water and wet down the entire washroom, etc.? Right and take ghusl. This is the this is the the thing that we are speaking about. That we need to know when something is compulsory. When up to what limit do I have? Up to what time do I have? And with regards to salah, with regards to salah, it is performed in a time limit also. So if we are going to perform salah, it means and we are in a state of janaba. Now it is compulsory. So some persons they may want to perform optional salah. Or they may have performed sunnah salah in a masjid for Aisha salah. They have had relations with their wife. They still have to perform with her salah. So now they are going to perform with her salah at 10 o'clock. So because they want to perform with her salah at 10 o'clock, just before 10 o'clock, ghusl becomes compulsory. Right? So hope we understand that inshallah. We are saying that the fiqh teaches us when different hypothetical situations that the fuqaha would bring about to teach us that you know if it were to happen in that manner then we would do such and such when does it become compulsory when it is sunnah when it is wajib when is it mustahab to do such we mentioned about the the timings that it is sunnah or mustahab to make ghusl on the day of jumma on the day of jumma it is sunnah to take ghusl inshallah so ghusl will become compulsory when we want to do an act whereby it's not permissible to do that without ghusl if we could have made wudu and do that act then then that would have sufficed but because the state that we are in wudu will not remove that impurity and we will come to that inshallah explain that more when we come up to that point 
Ghusl will automatically become compulsory in the last moments of the timing of a compulsory salah when that salah was not performed till then. And we explained that with wudu before. And just as we were explaining just now, now we spoke about a person performing salah on their own time. Now, inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaba mawkuta. Salah has been made compulsory upon the believers and there is a specified time. Angel Jibra'il alayhi salatu was salam, he, yes, on the Laylatul Mi'raj, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got the gift of five times daily salah and it is a gift for us also, alhamdulillah. With regards to the timings, it was not taught to him on Laylatul Mi'raj. Angel Jibra'il alayhi salatu was salam came afterwards and he led the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in salah and he taught him the timings of salah when we reach Kitab al-Salah inshallah, we will speak about that. So, the point that we are coming at is that for every salah, there is a timing. And alhamdulillah, the ummah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows that. And so, we have just performed our maghrib salah. And then, Isha salah will come in. In about 15 minutes or so, 15-20 minutes or so, Isha salah will come in. So, a person had from until roughly quarter to six until 6.58 to perform Maghrib. We are not speaking about which is the best time. The best time is the earliest time. But they were traveling. Again, they were in a situation whereby they could not take ghusl. They are coming to their home and they have to perform ghusl or they are at home and they are busy occupied doing something. Six o'clock goes by. They didn't take ghusl. So it's not compulsory at 6 o'clock to take ghusl. If they were going to perform salah at 6 o'clock, then because they were going to perform salah there, then ghusl is compulsory. Quarter past 6, they are not taking, they are not going to pray. So ghusl is not compulsory upon that time. Why? They are not going to perform salah. Half past 6, they are not going to pray. Ghusl does not become compulsory. When will ghusl become compulsory? Ghusl did not become compulsory before, but Ghusl will become compulsory when the time is going out and you now have to perform salah because if the time goes out, you will be sinful. A person will be sinful. So therefore, because the time is going out and it was not compulsory 6 o'clock or quarter past 6, now it is going to be compulsory quarter to 7, even before that, because you have to perform Ghusl in order for you to perform the Maghrib salah. So Ghusl will become compulsory in the last moments of the timing of a compulsory salah when that salah was not performed till then. When that salah was not performed till then, it was not performed at 6 o'clock, neither quarter past 6, neither half past 6. Before that, not compulsory. But now, listen, time is running out. You better perform ghusl because you have to perform your salah before the time goes out. Ghusl can become compulsory on a Muslim who is seen, balig, capable of, of using minimum and sufficient water for the compulsory elements of ghusl. Being in the state without ghusl and being free from menstruation as well as the being free from the state of impurity after childbirth in the case of women. We said ghusl can become compulsory before. Who does ghusl become compulsory upon? A Muslim? Just as we did in wudu, we will go over back these same things inshallah. Because a non-Muslim, it is not compulsory upon them to perform salah. They are not mukallaf of deen. So much so, in an Islamic state, where they pay the jizya, they are not compelled to come to the masjid when salah adhan is called. But the Muslims are compelled. The Muslims can get in trouble for not performing salah. But not the non-Muslims. They are not mukallaf of deen. They are not responsible for the sharia. The dictates of the sharia is not upon them. As soon as they say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulallah, then salah becomes compulsory. Salah becomes compulsory. So ghusl will become compulsory on a Muslim. If a non Muslim person has non Muslim relatives, they know they had relations, it might be hygienic for them to take ghusl, it might be hygienic for them to take a bath. But we cannot enforce that you must take a bath. It is compulsory upon you to take a bath. They are not Muslims. 
So therefore, taking bath is compulsory upon Muslims. So, ghusl is compulsory upon a Muslim. Who are you saying? Because as we said, if a person is insane, the, the sharia, the dictates of the sharia, again, does not fall upon their shoulders. It is not compulsory upon them. So if a person is insane, the, they do not have to perform salah, they do not know themselves, they are excused. They are excused. Balig, as we said, only when a person reaches the age of puberty, will it most likely then be essential upon them to, generally speaking, we are speaking about, generally speaking, will it be essential upon them to take? Gusul. Reaching the age of puberty means a boy, he has not wet dreams, nocturnal emission, right? A woman, a girl, she starts seeing what is called her periods, menstruation. So this is the age of being balik. Before that, before that, at the age of 11, Ghusl was not compulsory because they did not do anything. No sexual relations, no wet dream. So therefore, Ghusl does not become compulsory upon that time. Capable of using minimum and sufficient water for the compulsory elements of Ghusl. Now we will come to see, inshallah, we spoke a bit about that, the compulsory elements of Ghusl. What is being said here is that when Ghusl becomes compulsory upon an individual, when they have minimum water to make Ghusl. When they have minimum water to make Ghusl. Now, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bil muddi wa yagtasilu bil sa'i the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would make wudu with a mud of water, right? A little bit of water, a little lota. وَيَغْتَصِلُ بِسَعِي Four of that he would make ghusl with, like a, a little lota. Right? He would not make ghusl with, not that it is haram, he did also take ghusl from different vessels. He and his wife would share a vessel, Right? They would dip in the same vessel and take ghusl. So it means that they would have enough water in the air. So there is no restriction of water. The point that we are coming at is, is what we must understand. Because we are in the day and, day and age of pumps and showers, a person can tell themselves that the pump has shut down, water is just dripping in the, in the shower, and it is coming low in the tap underneath. So therefore, it is difficult to take a ghusl. No. What, when we speak about sufficient water for ghusl, it means the person has enough water, not necessarily for the shower that we would take and people take nowadays. A shower is sometimes understood as a person, you know, going in there and some people stay for length, a lengthy period, a long time. But when we speak about ghusl, Yes, it can be inclusive of the shower that we normally would take, but it doesn't mean that we have to be, water has to be pour, pouring upon us for minutes on end in order for this to be accomplished. All we need is a small amount of water whereby all the parts of the body can become wet, including our mouth and our nose. That is all we need. So it can be half bucket. It can be a jalita of water. Jalita bottle, the two liter bottle of water. Right? So, minimum and sufficient water. If we have a glass of water, if we have a glass of water, and uh, it's not sufficient to take ghusl, then ghusl will not be compulsory. We will come up to the chapter of tayammum, inshallah. That is the other form. Wudu, ghusl, and tayammum. These are three acts of purification that will be able to remove invisible impurities. Invisible impurities. So we must be able to use minimum water in order for ghusl to become compulsory. If we do not have that amount of water, sufficient water to make ghusl, ghusl does not become compulsory. We may also have a bucket of water. Sometimes we, we, we will travel with a keg of water and... Uh, in those days, in the previous days, they would travel with the ox carts and the carriages with the horses. So when they would be carrying water, they may have a keg of water that a person could take ghusl with 
And we also, if we are driving from place to place, sometimes in Trinidad that may be difficult to understand, right? Because, mashallah, most places we have water, right? If you don't have water on land, you'll get water in the sea. If you don't have water in the sea, you will get it in the swamp. You don't have it in the swamp, you will get it in the ponds, etc. So we may have a lot of water, but if there is a situation whereby there is not sufficient water because we have to use this water to drink or we have a keg of water but there are many of us and if we use this, if I go on, if I wake up in the middle of the night and I use this water for ghusl, everybody wakes up in the, water, in the morning to get good clean drinking water and the keg of water is done, it would put everybody in difficulty. So therefore, it must be in such a manner that we have enough water to make ghusl, for ghusl to become compulsory. Otherwise, we may have to resort to tayammum. Being in a state without ghusl, being in a state without ghusl, in order for ghusl to become compulsory, we must need ghusl in the first place. So sometimes people are sweaty, so they want to go and take a shower. Now, lack of water, lack of water, and uh, we want to perform salah. We have to ask ourselves, are we in a state of minor ritual impurity or major ritual impurity? Islam is a very easy religion. If we are not in a state of major ritual impurity, we'll come to explain that, hey, where we need ghusl, then do not take ghusl if it is difficult. Right? Salah will stand in, in five minutes. We do not need to take ghusl. But we are thinking, I am a bit sticky. We don't need to take ghusl because we are sticky. Because we will come to see the compulsory, the factors that cause ghusl to become compulsory. So therefore, being in a state without ghusl means we had a wet dream. We had sexual relations. Or the women who have come off their menses, hive. Or they have, uh, they have completed their afterbirth bleeding. Now they need ghusl. Then we will think that it is necessary for us to make ghusl. Before that, ghusl is not compulsory. Being free from menstruation as well as in a state of impurity after childbirth in a case of women. Eh? A, woman who, a woman who is in her menses... Doesn't mean she cannot be in. Yes, she can be in. She can take a shower. She can cleanse herself. But that would not be the ghusl that would cause her to become pure to read Quran. It will not be the ghusl that would cause her to become pure to perform salah. When she finishes her menses, no, it would be essential upon her to take this ghusl that we are speaking about. As well as being, in a being free from Impurity after childbirth in the case of women. Generally speaking, when a woman has a child, after she has a child, she will experience that which is called nifas, after birth bleeding. Again, it does not mean that she cannot bathe. She can bathe, yes. But can she read Quran when she is in this after birth bleeding? Can she read Quran with this bath? No. Even if she does it in a sequence, as how we would take ghusl. Yet still she cannot read Quran with that because she's in a state of menses. So when will ghusl become compulsory? Ghusl, ghusl is not compulsory upon her when she is experiencing this bleeding. When she is free from that bleeding, then ghusl will become compulsory, inshallah. We will stop here, inshallah, and take questions. Right? So Adhan will be at 7 o'clock. Last day, the question was asked about sometimes we are performing salah and there's a gap, right? The, a gap is formed because we spoke about the person breaking their wudu and they may have to leave even from the front line. So if it is easy for them to leave, the muftis have mentioned and the scholars have mentioned, they will go through the people and they will go to make their wudu. If it is in a case whereby, like for example, they, are, they have, mashallah, reached in the front line, Haramain Sharifain, in Makkah or Medina. But if they were to even try to go and make wudu and come back, it would be impossible. Because of the lines, they would not be able to pass. 
So if it is impossible for them to pass, they will sit and sit there until, because they cannot perform salah, they will sit and wait until they can get to go and make wudu and then they would have to perform their salah afterwards. Allah knows their intention. They didn't break their wudu intentionally or even if they broke their wudu intentionally, they cannot perform salah. But we were speaking about the person, they broke their wudu, small masjid, they went outside, there's a gap. That very person can come back in front and fill his space. That is one option to fill that space. The second option that the scholars have mentioned is that the person from the back line, they could, they could walk to the front line. But there's a mannerism of how they walk. Because as we were speaking about, if everyone has to come from the side, it means everyone would have to take a step. If they take one step at any rate, their salah will not become broken, inshallah. Their chest would be facing the direction of the Qibla. Their salah will not become broken. What the scholars have mentioned, and what is also mentioned in Fatawa Mahmudiya, and what is also mentioned in Ad-Dur al-Mukhtar, that according to the Hanafis, the Hanafi jurists, a person should take one step wait for the amount of time it would take to perform one rukun and then take another step and then go forward hey they will be performing salah so they can take one step this must lies in connection with amal and kathir what happens is that the hanafis they are very strict with regards to movement in salah and they have made a differentiation between little action and plenty action. Amalan Khalil and Amalan Kathir. Amalan Kathir will break salah. So therefore, when a person is performing salah, the Hanafis they have described different, they have differences of opinion with regards to when will a person break their salah. Some say if you do it three times in one posture of salah, your salah will become broken. Why? It is Amalan Kathir. So like we are performing salah, we scratch here once, twice, three times, four times, salah will become broken, according to some of the Hanafi jurists. Other Hanafi jurists are of the opinion that your salah will become broken when the onlooker thinks, looks at you and he thinks that you are not in salah. Because you are not just scratching and putting back your hand, but you are scratching and looking up, looking down and looking to the side, your, your chest is towards the Qibla, right? Means facing the direction of the Qibla. But how you look is that you are not in Salah. So according to these jurists, which is predominantly used, this fatwa, that when an onlooker were to look at the individual and the person looks like they are not in Salah, then that would break their Salah. So, again, with regards to the plenty of movement, yes, there are a hadith that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he picked up the child, etc. The Hanafi jurists have mentioned he would have done certain things, certain actions they would have done that was before the ayat that was revealed, Wakumu lillahi qanitin. And stand to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala submissively, stand to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with concentration and devotion. If you look at the sequence of how speaking in salah was before, and then it was abrogated. You can't do that anymore. They did different actions when they were in salah. If you could talk in salah, then probably they would have moved their hands also. Right? So different actions were not prohibited in salah. Then afterwards, eventually, it became prohibited. So the Hanafi jurists, based upon the, ayat, the, the ayats of the Holy Quran and the ahadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are very strict. So they don't say, you can walk from two lines behind and come and fill, fill the gap in front. What they say is that, take your time. If you take two steps, generally speaking, you will not break your salah. But how they advise is that a person can take one step, wait for the amount of time to perform one rukun, reciting subhanallah three times, then take a next step. Give and take, if a person takes two steps, inshallah, their salah should not become broken. If they take one large step, their salah will not become broken. But they should not take three steps together, no more than that. Mutawaliyan is mentioned in the Arabic ibarat, continuously. Otherwise, to the onlooker, it will look like what? They are not performing salah, they are walking. 
Of course, they are working to, to fix the salah, yet still they should be precautious not to do it continuously, but they should break it in between. Take one step, pause for three subhanallahs, the amount to perform one rukun, then take a next step. And like that, inshallah, they can fill the gap in front. Right? So that is the, with the hawala and the reference of Ad-Dur al-Mukhtar. They have mentioned that if a person pauses in between, then it would not cause the, their salah to become broken, inshallah. No, no. We, we, when the question is, can a person just sit down and recite Quran, whether from memory, not even from touching the Quran, or from by touching the Quran, it is not permissible for us, according to the Hanafi jurist, to touch the Holy Quran or to recite the Holy Quran in a state of when a person needs a bath. If we need wudu, we can re recite Quran from memory. But when a person needs bath, they cannot recite Quran at all. They can do dhikr, inshallah. Right? They can do dhikr. Right? And sometimes it is mentioned that if a person recites ayats of the Quran on the level of dua, with the intention of dua, right? Because the, uh, the words of the Quran is Arabic. So even if we want to speak the language, we, we can speak the Arabic language and make up the words just like that in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He mentions about du'as, du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, other du'as, but they are, they are words of the Quran. So therefore, a person, if a person recites like Rabbana, that is a du'a. They should not do it with the intent of, A'udhu billahi minashaytan irrajim, bismillahi rahman irrahim, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana, and with all the tajweed rules and so on. No. Right? Allah watch hit dua upon the angle and mannerism of dua, not upon the manner of, mannerism of tilawat of Quran. We cannot read Quran, but we can do zikr. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, whilst we are in a state of janaba. Good, inshallah. So we will stop here, inshallah. Time for Adhan has gone. We will continue next day. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum.